to concept four honors notes on photosynthesis. I will warn you, this is going to be a longer video than normal, but in class, we're going to break this up into smaller chunks, but just for the sake of the video, I'm going to film it all in one take. So please do not watch this all in one take. It's a lot of information all at once. Okay, a little overview. All organisms need a constant supply of energy to survive. We've talked about this. And for most life on Earth, the ultimate source of that energy is going to be the sun. So when the sun dies, Earth is going to die because we need it. Now, you and I can't go outside and do anything by laying out in the sun. It doesn't energize us. But there are organisms that can, photosynthesizers. They can convert the energy source that the sun is into something that's actually usable. And they do that in a process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the overall process by which sunlight, which is solar energy or light energy, water and carbon dioxide are gonna be chemically converted, so a chemical reaction's happening, into chemical energy stored in the form of glucose, which is a sugar or a carbohydrate. Water gets absorbed through the roots of the plant CO2 comes through these pores in the plant's leaves called stomata. Um, and it can be represented, this whole process is represented by the following chemical equation. So six carbon dioxides plus six waters with solar energy will make one glucose, which is C6H12O6 and six oxygen. You will definitely need to know this equation by heart. And a chemical equation, if you remember, is just like a recipe. You have ingredients, which are your reactants. And in this case, that's carbon dioxide and water. And you have your product, which are your results. In this case, that's glucose and oxygen. Now, solar energy from the sun is necessary for photosynthesis to happen. And like all chemical reactions, there are enzymes involved too. But we don't consider the solar energy or the enzymes a, an ingredient or a result. And so they're, if they're written, they're written over the arrow. So they're not on the reactant or the product side. So just know that's the appropriate place to write that when you write your equation out. All of this is going down in the chloroplast, which is a special organelle that plants have. And it has two main parts, which correspond to the two steps of photosynthesis that happen in each part. The grana, to me, that looks like a stack of pancakes. So I think of it as a pancake-like stack of thylakoid membrane. So each individual pancake-looking thing is thylakoid membrane. The whole stack is a stack. They're stacks of grana. The stroma is the fluid-like part, so it's all the space in between, and I think of that as the syrup. So the first step of photosynthesis happens in the grana, and the second in the stroma. So I think you put your pancakes on the plate first, and then you put your syrup, and so that's how I always remember the order. So a quick side note, why are plants green? But this is actually relevant. They're green because of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a pigment that plants have in their thylakoid membrane. So when we were just talking about the structure of the chloroplast, that chlorophyll is in the thylakoid membrane. And there are several types of chlorophyll. There are other pigments called carotenoids, and they absorb every color of light in, from the sun except for the color green. And so what's left over is green, and green is what's reflected, and we see what's reflected. So everything that's not absorbed gets reflected, and green is the one that is reflected which is a simplified way of explaining why they're green, which is pretty cool, but it's because of that chlorophyll. Okay, like I mentioned, photosynthesis has two stages or two sets of reactions, the light-dependent de reaction and the light-independent reaction. The light-dependent reaction is also the photo part of photosynthesis. Photo means light. It requires, it depends on light, so it requires solar energy. It's also can be referred to this stage as the electron transport chain or the light reaction. You can abbreviate electron transport chain, ETC. The light independent reaction is the synthesis part. Synthesis is to make something. So we're gonna make sugar in this step. It does not require any solar energy. So some people refer to it as the dark reaction. It is also known as the Calvin cycle. So in biology, we like to keep things as complicated as possible and give you 14 names for the same thing. I'm sorry, but it just is how it is. So we gotta get all those names straight. So now we're gonna walk through each of these steps. We're gonna hit the big picture purpose, where it's going down, a summary, and then I'll get into the nitty gritty details with you. So purpose, 
we're going to capture energy from the sun and we're going to store it in energy carrying molecules. They're ATP and NADPH. If you remember, you should know ATP from concept two, which was all about it. But I mentioned that there are other energy carrying molecules like ATP. But ATP is the main currency of the cell. It's the main thing our cells are going to be using. But there are other ones too, and so we're introducing one here. You're going to get introduced to NADH and FADH too in cellular respiration. So there's others that are coming along, but so you need to keep track of these. I remember NADPH is photosynthesis because it has the P in it. This first step is happening in the grana, specifically the thylakoid membrane, so the pancakes, because that is where chlorophyll is. And remember, chlorophyll is the pigment that can absorb sunlight. So if the purpose of this step is to capture energy from the sun, we got to have chlorophyll to do it. So what's going down? Water molecules are split into hydrogen and oxygen, and so oxygen gets released as a waste product here. What a great waste product because it allows us to breathe. And ATP and NADPH, these energy carrying molecules, are going to be charged up by the sun. So technically they're ADP and NADP+, plus, but then once they um, get that energy from the sun, they are ATP and NADPH. Okay, so the details. What's really going down here? Energy from the sun gets passed down the electron transport chain, and then it gets stored in the bonds of ATP and NADPH. So what is that? What's this ETC, this electron transport chain? The light energy from the sun excites a bunch of electrons. That E minus is an abbreviation for electrons. Those electrons move down the ETC, down the concentration gradient. At the end, they combine with final electron acceptors or carriers of NADP plus and ADP, and that's where we get the NADPH and ATP, or the charged up versions of, with energy. If you remember that word chemiosmosis from concept two, this is a chemiosmotic process because the hydrogen ions are going to move down the concentration gradient from where there's more to where there's less, and that's what's going to charge up the ATP. When all is said and done, ATP, NADPH, and those hydrogen ions are going to leave the grana and go into the stroma for the next stage of photosynthesis. So how is light absorbed? Photosystems absorb light. And this is a diagram of what's going down. So if you thought that last side slide was complicated, it's much more complicated, but I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can for you. So photosystems are clusters of chlorophyll and proteins, and they trap energy from the sun. And remember, chlorophyll is a, chlorophyll, excuse me, is a pigment that can absorb sunlight. And then that energy gets transferred to electrons and makes them really excited. And then thus they, they can move down the, the electron transport chain and charge up that ATP and NADPH. Okay, so I mentioned electron carriers a couple of times. What does that mean? An electron carrier is just a molecule that carries electrons in order to pass on their energy. So example, NADP plus can accept a pair of high energy electrons and then it can transfer those to another molecule. So NADP plus is gonna grab or carry two electrons and a hydrogen ion and it's gonna become NADPH. It can then carry that energy that it's storing from the light dependent reaction to the light independent reaction that it's gonna power. So the first step that light dependent is powered by sunlight and the second step is gonna be powered by ATP and NADPH that we charged up in this first step. Okay, a little bit simpler drawing. I love this because it's showing big picture, but remember this is all going down on a cellular level. So we're zooming in on a plant cell here and specifically a chloroplast. So in that thylakoid membrane, light energy from the sun gets absorbed by chlorophyll. Water is coming through the roots and going into the thylakoid membrane as well, and oxygen is produced. ATP and NADPH get charged up and they're gonna move on to power the Calvin cycle or the light independent reaction, which is step two. So the purpose of the second step is to use the energy from those energy carrying molecules that we got from the light dependent reaction and we're gonna make glucose. That was the whole point of the whole process was to make glucose. And this is gonna happen in the stroma or the syrupy part of the chloroplast, the fluid part. So, summary, this is also known as the Calvin cycle. It's a series of enzyme-assisted chemical reactions 
powered by ATP and NADPH that produce three carbon sugars from carbon dioxide and from water. And the hydrogen from water, excuse me. The cycle happens two times. And then these three carbon sugars are going to combine to make one glucose molecule, which is a six carbon molecule. That's C6, that's six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. So we're going through this whole process twice. All right, here are the details. I just want you to remember, grab, split, leave, switch. That will help you. Grab, split, leave, switch. So first, grab. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the stroma. An enzyme is going to attach carbon dioxide, so that's one carbon, to a five carbon, 5C, five that's a five carbon molecule called RUBP. That stands for ribulose biphosphate. Okay, so it's going to attach to that. We now have a really unstable six carbon molecule. Unstable molecules do not like how they are, so it's not going to want to stay that way. So it's going to result in that six carbon molecule splitting in half. So energy from ATP and NADPH and an enzyme, of course, because all of this is mediated by enzymes, is going to break the six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. Okay, so we're just splitting that in half into two. And those are PGA, which is phosphoglycerate. Now, we have two three-carbon molecules, but we're not done yet. Each of those three-carbon molecules, the PGAs, get converted into a different three-carbon molecule called G3P. One of those G3Ps, that stands for a glycerol aldehyde three phosphate, is going to leave the cycle. It's going to go on to become glucose. Remember, we're going to do this phase twice. That's where we'll get the other one from. So this, this is half of the glucose forming here. The other is moving on to the next step, which is switching. That remaining G3P gets converted back to a 5-carbon RUBP that's going to, um, by using a phosphate from ATP, and then the cycle is going to start all over again. Because remember, we're going to do this twice, and this is a continual process. This is what that looks like if you were going to write out all of the formulas, if you will, for each of the different compounds. It's a lot going on, but just you need to remember, grab a carbon dioxide and stick it to that 5-carbon RUBP. Now we've got a 6-carbon molecule. It's really unstable. So step two, it's going to split in half. Step three, those are going to be converted um, from PGA to G3P. One's going to leave to go on to become glucose, and one's going to be converted back, switch back to five carbon RUBP. So again, we're using ATP and NADPH from the first step to power the second step, and then eventually, and overall, we're using carbon dioxide to make sugar in the second step. Now remember, not every producer ever is doing photosynthesis. A small amount do chemosynthesis where they make their own food from chemicals instead of sunlight. We talked about this in concept three. Now, how quickly this can happen is affected by a couple things. One of those being light intensity. Um, higher light intensity means um, more electrons can be excited, causing um, light reactions to happen faster. So that light dependent reaction can happen faster. Also, the amount of carbon dioxide. The more ingredients there are to work with um, and process through the cycle, the, um, the more it can happen. And then temperature, actually. In general, an increased temperature will accelerate the chemical reaction because of the kinetic molecular theory. The higher temperature means higher kinetic energy, so those particles are moving faster and colliding more. All right, so here's a question I want you to think about. Why would root cells not need chloroplasts? Okay, well, let's think. Chloroplasts have thylakoid membrane, which has chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is a pigment that captures sunlight in order to do photosynthesis. So why would these not need chloroplasts? Well, they're underground. They're not exposed to the sun, so they can't do photosynthesis. Now, one last thing I would be remiss if we didn't talk about is alternative pathways. So I mentioned at the very beginning of these notes that stomata are pores on the underside of leaves. And here's what happens in those stomata. Plants lose excess water through those stomata in a process called transpiration. We'll talk about transpiration in ecology unit when we talk about the water cycle. Also through those stomata, carbon dioxide goes in that to be an ingredient for photosynthesis and oxygen goes out. 
as it's made from photosynthesis. So if it's too hot or dry out, the plant's going to close its stomata so it doesn't lose too much water. It doesn't want this water to, um, to leave it and it become dehydrated, so it's going to close those up. The problem with that then is it eliminates gas exchange. Carbon dioxide can't get in to do photosynthesis, and oxygen that's made from photosynthesis that's happening can't get out. So that's an issue. So what happens? Levels of CO2 drop because CO2 can't get in, and levels of oxygen increase because it can't get out. And this causes something called photorespiration, which is where oxygen gets added into the carbon or the Calvin cycle instead of carbon dioxide. And that means we can't make sugar, which means we're not going to eventually be able, as consumers, to get ATP from that sugar. And so this is wasting the plant's resources. So we have some alternatives that can happen if a plant is um, closing its stomata in fear of dehydration. There's the CAM pathway and the C4 pathway. First, let's talk about CAM. This is done by plants like cacti and pineapples. So what they will do um, is they'll open their stomata at night and then they'll close them during the day. So that way they're not losing water at the hottest part of the day, but they can still open their stomata at night and allow um, that car gas exchange to occur. So this is what the opposite of what normal plants do. It's gonna cause them to grow more slowly than regular plants, but it's, it's an effective way for them to avoid photorespiration. And then last is C4. This is done by corn and sugarcane. Um, these are plants that need a lot of water, so we don't wanna lose um, a lot of water. So what they'll do is during the hottest part of the day, they'll just partially close their stomata to help prevent um, water from leaving through transpiration, but is still allow that gas exchange and avoid photorespiration. And that is photosynthesis for all you honor students.